Good evening, and thank you so much for being with us here at Powerhouse Church. We're so excited that you're here, and we're so excited what God is doing in this place. And that was a little video from this last weekend. Uh, Eve and I had opportunity to go to Phoenix, I mean to Houston, Texas, to really get a close-up look to a ministry that our church is actually supporting. It's a ministry called Sunday, Sunday School, Sidewalk Sunday School. I get my names mixed up. Sidewalk Sunday School, and it's awesome. What it is is an opportunity to go into neighborhoods, into apartment complexes, and share the gospel with kids. I mean, what's better than that, right? And so part of us going out was to just see what it was all about up close and personal, to see if it's something that we could do out here. And what's neat is, is that most of these kids, they're not connected to a church at all. Their parents are not saved but they get an opportunity to hear the gospel at their own level. And it was just beautiful to see and to watch. And some of the stories that I've heard is that not only kids have been giving their lives to Jesus, but also the parents starting to see a change in their kids. And then they start checking out who Jesus was as well. And so we're just really excited. And because of your generosity and giving, we get to support them monthly. And so we're supporting the work of the kingdom Uh, One of the things I always say here, we'll never change the world in these four walls. It's all about what we do outside in the community. We're supposed to be the light of the world, and we're shining God's light on this dark world around us. And we just wanted to do so much in our community, and I'm excited as we continue to grow uh, so that the vision of God's church that he's set to be built here in Las Vegas will accomplish all the purposes that he's done. So thank you so much for being a part of that, through your generosity, because it means a lot to us, because not only do we get to do what we do here on Sundays, but we get to support many ministries, not only around our community, but around the world, who are doing great things for King Jesus. Well, while I was gone last week, Leo filled in, and he did an outstanding job. Can you give Leo a round of applause? It was so great to just listen to that message. And, you know, what's, what's awesome about it is that May is the month of mental health awareness. You know, it's something that we all struggle with and deal with at some level. You know, some people say, well, you just need to pray more. You know, you just need to suck it up, right? But anxiety, stress, depression, those things are real. And they can even happen to men and women of God, that we go through things. And Leo gave a great message to talk about Jehovah Shalom, that Jesus is our peace. And some of the times when we're going through a mental health crisis, we can feel like the world and doors are closing in on us. We can feel like the enemy is bigger than God is at that point, right? And so he shared this awesome story about Elisha, the prophet, and it was this young man who was with him. And he was getting real fearful because all the enemy that was there seemed very menacing, And Elisha asked the Lord to open up this young man's eyes so he could see all the angels of God standing all around. And that's just a reminder to us that when we're going through something, that, you know, he who is in us is greater than who is in the world. And that God is all around us, that, you know, as followers of Christ, that we all have our guardian angel who is watching out for us as well. And that's just another reason, too, to get connected to the body of Christ, that we all need one another, You know, we're here to serve each other, to bless each other, to encourage each other, to pray for each other, but also to bear one another's burden. There should be a brother or sister in Christ you can call and say, hey, I'm just struggling right now. I could just really use some prayer. See, the enemy wants us to be off by ourselves. He wants us to be lonely and not connected. But I'm telling you, when we're connected to the body, man, we're so strong, and God's spirit is here in this place, filling all of us. And so I just want to encourage you to get connected. Get connected. We have an awesome time on Tuesdays for our Bible study. Um, All of us kind of study and learn together, and God just speaks through all of us. So I get to learn from all of you. You get to learn from me. And so we just want to invite you to be a part of that. And if you do want to be a part of that, please indicate that on your Connect card, and we will get you the information so that you can be a part of that. And also prayer. Wednesday night is our hour of power, and I'm telling you, some nights I'm in tears because of the powerful prayers that have been prayed by my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so if you have prayer requests, you can send those in, and we will lift, up, lift you up, lift up your family, and whatever you're going through. So let's be a place that we love each other. You know, that's what's missing in our love. In our, in our, in our world is love. 
You know, we live in a selfie, self-centered world where everybody only cares about me, myself, and I, and we want to be a church that cares about one another. Well, two weeks ago, we started a brand new series that's called Intimacy with God. That I just believe if we can have a close proximity with God, a close relationship with him, it has the ability to change everything in our lives. But what ends up happening in our lives, we have this slow drift away from God. And sometimes a slow drift, we don't even notice what's really happening. All of a sudden, we find ourselves far from God. We don't hear from God. We don't feel close to him. You know, all of a sudden, we stop reading our Bibles. We stop praying. We stop attending church. We stop fellowshipping. And we are so far away from God. And God wants us to have an intimate relationship with him. And when we do, it changes us. Because, see, when we are walking with God, we're walking in the light. And what happens is, is when we start this slow drift, we start drifting into the darkness. We start drifting away from God. And God is calling us into a close proximity with him. And so it's my hope that through this series that you would hear something and that the Lord will speak to your heart to show you in ways you may have drifted, in ways that you may be walking in the darkness and not even know, so that you can come back to the light. And when we look at the life of Jesus, I mean, he has such an intimacy with his father that he knew his father's will and he accomplished everything that his father had him to do on this earth. And God wants us to be the same. God didn't just save us for heaven. God, we were created in Christ Jesus for good work. God has a work for you. God wants to order your steps and direct your life so like Jesus, you could finish what he put you here to do. And see, Jesus is our ultimate example. See, we sometimes look at other people and go, man, I really like that guy. I really like that young lady. I mean, she's awesome for Jesus. That's great, but they're not your example. Your example is Jesus and Jesus alone. See, God the Father wants us to have the same kind of relationship that he has with Jesus. So the goal of every follower of Christ is to be conformed into the likeness of Christ. See, 1 John was written by the Apostle John who he dubbed himself as the one that Jesus loved. Right? Sound kind of like, really? He loves me too. When I used to first read through that, I used to think John was kind of prideful by doing that. But John wasn't boasting in himself. He was just so close to God that he loved him. Everybody should feel like I'm the one that God loves. But he could say that because of his close proximity with him. And he had this intimate relationship with God. And I just think this is why God had him actually pen this epistle is because of his nearness to God and how he always walked in the light. And so John knew about intimacy. John knew about intimacy with God, and John wants to teach that to us. And so this whole series is about journeying through the first, uh, journeying through first John. And so our first message that we had, we really talked about the light and darkness. What we learned is that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. That our intimacy with God begins when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Like that is the first step to come into the kingdom of God is accepting him by faith. And something awesome happens when we do that. We actually leave the darkness and we walk into the light. But what's so significant about the light is that it exposes the darkness. See, the problem with the darkness is that people love the darkness because their deeds are evil. That's why they love the darkness. See, in the darkness, nobody can see what you're doing. That's why most of the people who do most of the bad things, they wait to nighttime to do it. But the remedy to intimacy, the remedy to that is intimacy with God. All of us were born in sin, and we were shaped in iniquity. And our lives before Christ, whether we realize it or not, was intimacy with the darkness. Think about that. That's what our lives were before Christ. We had intimacy with the darkness. See, who we say that we are in Christ is revealed by our willingness or unwillingness to be exposed and changed by God's light. See, we can either have fellowship with God in the light, which leads to a growing intimacy, or we can actually deceive ourselves by living in the darkness. 
And when we live in the darkness, we actually grow in the darkness. We actually start moving further and further away from God because we're moving further and further away from his light. It's kind of like roaches. <laughs> roaches like to operate in the dark. I mean, when it's dark, they're doing their thing. But what happens when the light comes on? <laughs> right? Because they hate the light. And that's what people are like who walk in darkness and don't walk in the light. See, when a light comes on, it exposes the roaches. And we, as followers of Christ, if we want intimacy with God, we must allow the light to expose our sin and be willing to repent, to turn from our sins, because in God there is no darkness at all. So today we're going to continue this series through 1 John. And I just want us to apply these truths to our lives So that we can see in what areas, God, am I walking in darkness? In what areas, God, am I blocking myself and not letting your light expose my sin? Because I want us to have an intimacy with God because that's God's heart. He wants us to have intimacy with him. Because if we do, it will transform us that we will start looking and loving just like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your word. We just come to you, Lord, as your servants, Lord, who are hungry for you. Father, I pray that we would block out our distractions and our thoughts about anything else. And, Lord, let us focus on your word. Lord, may I move out of the way. May you fill this place with your spirit, that your word that goes forth will not return void. But, Father, touch each person's heart in a way they need to hear it and receive it. And so, Father, I just thank you in advance for the good word that you're going to bring today and that it will find find fertile soil in the hearts of those who are here. So God, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to us, and we'll be careful, God, to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And so we're jumping into this, and I just believe again that when we can focus on our intimacy with God and be honest with ourselves. See, the problem with lying is that it's easy to believe a lie when we want to stay in darkness. But see, Jesus Christ is the truth, and he's in the light. So we have to be willing to to change and adjust our thinking and our actions of what we do so that we can walk into the light. See, God created us in his own image so that he could have a relationship with us. God is spirit, and so are we. But God is perfect in holiness, God is perfect in righteousness, and we are not. So God made Jesus our substitute so that we could be made holy and righteous. Amen? See, Jesus did his part when he hung on a rugged cross for us. But we have a part to play as well. See, Jesus' death and resurrection, it removed the penalty of sin. And us being filled with the Holy Spirit will will remove the power of sin. That's called sanctification. But see, that activity can't happen if we're in the darkness. That activity can only be accomplished if we're walking in the light. This is why when we sin, it's always by choice. This is why when we sin, it's always by choice. Because, see, if we're walking in darkness, we deceive ourselves because our sin is not exposed and we actually start believing the lie that we don't sin. Just like last week I said, some people believe they don't sin. They only have make accidents and make mistakes. You know, they only have whoopsies. I didn't mean that. I I didn't do that. But if the Bible calls it sin, then it's sin. There are no perfect people, only a perfect Savior who is perfecting imperfect people. See, there's only one perfect person that ever walked this earth, and his name is Jesus. He is our perfect Savior, and if we allow his Holy Spirit's work in our life, he will be perfecting imperfect people. And John, as he's speaking, he now wants these Christians who he's writing to, to know that God has not abandoned them but gives them his son as an advocate on their behalf. And he's an advocate of ours too. 
So what's so great about God's word is it transcended. It's never just for the readers who was in that time of biblical times. It's also for the church of us today. And so I love God's word because it's moving, it's active, it's sharpening any two-edged sword. So God's word is prevalent for us today. So let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. It says, my children, I am writing this to you so that you do not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. See, now, when John talks about them not sinning, he is speaking mainly about willful or intentional sin. He's talking about putting sin on your calendar. He's talking about making plans to commit adultery. He's talking about making plans to hook up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Choosing not to pay tithes and give back to God what belongs to him. He's talking about whatever is contrary to the word of God. Because anything contrary to the word of God is sin. And John's statement also includes unintentional sin. See, we all sin daily by word, by thought, by deed. Even things we aren't conscious of that we've done, many times it's sin. See, I like to call our flesh our sin suit. This means that we, until we are perfected and leave this body, we will fall short of God's holy standard every single day. And that's why last week we talked about 1 John 1.9, where if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God's like, I know you're going to sin today. I'm just waiting for you to confess it. Because when we don't do that, we start sliding into the darkness. But when we confess it, he forgives, he cleanses, and he keeps us right there in the light. And since we have a growing intimacy, God wants that to have, wants us to have for that in our lives. He wants us to have this growing intimacy, but that intimacy can only happen when we're walking in the light. And God was so kind that he gave us an advocate in Jesus Christ. The Greek word for advocate is parakletos, which means one who pleads another's cause or to help another by defending and comforting him. It's kind of funny because Leo just kind of mentioned that when we were just talking a little bit earlier. So, you know, when, when something is said twice, it's really established that God wanted it to be said. See, God showed his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died. But God continues to show his love for us by giving us an advocate. Someone to plead to God the Father on our behalf. I mean, this alone should inspire us and motivate us to live a life that's pleasing to God. That God is like, God, I'm not going to walk in willful sin. I'm not going to do it, God. You've done too much for me. God, look what you've done. You sent your son to die for me, and now he's actually an advocate, and you've given me your Holy Spirit? You know what, God? Your grace is so amazing. I'm going to choose not to walk in willful sin. And then John continues to explain what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary in verse 2. He says, he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. See, Jesus is not only our advocate, but he's also our atoning sacrifice. He satisfied God's demand of righteousness by his own blood. And what's even more beautiful about that, he did it for the whole world. He's done it for everyone who's ever lived and everyone who's yet to be born. I mean, that's mind-blowing. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. God has given everybody an avenue to become righteous and holy. See, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And God has an expectation That because of his amazing grace, we're like, God, I'm going to walk in the light. I'm going to trust you, God, and I'm going to walk in the light. When I fail you, God, I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm going to turn from that, and I'm going to be righteous, God, because you called me to be righteous. And God chose, when I was processing this, I just, I couldn't believe that God chose to kill his own son so that he could have intimacy and fellowship with the people that he created. Think about that. Think about if you have a child, would you give that child up for a whole bunch of people who you don't know, for people who are going to blaspheme you, people who are going to curse you? 
That's the depths of God's love and the passion that he has for his creation. This is why at the end of life, no one will have an excuse. Salvation has come to all people. No one will have an excuse. God gives each person an opportunity to come to know him by faith. And God has gone through great lengths to do that. And what I love about Christianity is the only religion where the Savior, where the creator of the religion died for the people. See, every other religion, you got to get, you got to, get to your God. you got to get to him. But our God came down to us. He lifted us up out of our sin. Come on, God is so good and so awesome. And he's calling us to walk in the light so that we can grow our intimacy with him. And what God wants to do is God wants to be known. God wants to be known by us. But guess what? We can never know God if we're walking in the darkness. Because, see, our proximity is too wide. To know someone, you got to be close. you got to be intimate with them. And actually, John actually continues to speak and give us the measuring stick to validate if we truly know God. So if you want to know if you truly know God, listen to verse 3 and 4. It says, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandment, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. See, to know him is a term for deep intimacy. The deepest intimacy of a human relationship is a marriage between a man and a woman. Because they get to become one flesh. They get to come together to become one. And God really shows this in Genesis 4.1. He says, now Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from God. See, their intimacy was so close that it actually brought forth life. Think about that. God wants to have that kind of intimacy with us. He wants to have this oneness with us. See, to know God is to have an intimate, growing, deep relationship with him. This way we know that we know him is through obedience to his word. Are you obeying God's word? Are you having a growing, thriving intimacy with him? See, God's not going to force us to do anything. God gives all of us free will. He doesn't create robots. He does his part, but he's calling us to do his. Obedience to God leads to a growing intimacy, which leads us into a deeper love and fellowship. But see, the opposite is true also. Disobedience to God, it leads to a fractured intimacy that leads to a superficial love. Think about that. You go, you know God, you know Jesus. Yeah, I know Jesus. Man, man, Jesus is awesome, yeah. But I'm living this life contrary to that truth. You know, I can wear a T-shirt. I can do the religious gymnastics. I can do all these things. I can say to Christianese. But if I'm not walking in the light, and if I'm not walking in obedience to God's word, I'm actually lying. You know, I'm lying to myself. I don't have intimacy with God. I'm actually a part of this slow drift into the darkness away from the light. See, people who are disobedient to God, this is what they do. They only come to him when they're in a jam or when they need him for something. God, I promise if you, you do this, I, I promise I'm, I'll go back to church. God, I promise. You know, they, they start making deals with God. This is what Christians will try to do. Christians will try to reduce God to a Burger King, thinking that they could have him their own way. But God wants us to know he's not our genie in the bottle. He's not our break the glass in case of emergency. Our God is holy. He's righteous. He is perfect. And he desires a growing intimate relationship with us. But see, when we walk in disobedience to God's word, we can actually think that we're close to God because we're a so-called good person, because of our church attendance, because we compare ourselves to other people. Like, look at him. I can't believe they keep robbing banks, they keep doing all this violence. And what we do is we think that we're good because of how bad they are. 
But see, that person is not our standard. Jesus is our standard. And this is what God says about that. He says, you are a liar and you're not living in the truth. See, sometimes we can live a lie so long and fool other people, we wind up fooling ourselves. 1 John 2 uh, verse 5 says this, but those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know that we're living in him. The Greek word for truly is alethos, alethos. It is an adverb that means in fact, really sincerely, and most certainly. See, church, we can only love God because he first loved us. And God's grace is so wonderful, it should make us fall deeper and deeper in love with him. But this is another problem that many Christians have. Many Christians think that they can do good things for God that makes up for them disobeying him. But God cares more about who you're becoming than what you do for him. But that's what God cares about. You can come and do all of these labors and all these awesome things, but if you're walking in disobedience to God, you're still living in sin and you're walking in the darkness. Even if what you're doing is a great sacrifice. And this was one of the issues with Israel's first king, King Saul. See, during the journey of the children of Israel, when they were uh, walking through the wilderness, the Amalekites came against the children of Israel. And after that episode, God made a promise. He says, I'm going to wipe out the Amalekites from the face of the earth. You know, if God says something, he intends to do it. And so now when King Saul was, was king over Israel, God was ready to fulfill what he promised to do. And so God spoke through his prophet Samuel, and he told, he told the king to go in and to annihilate, to kill everything that breathes. And so King Saul went in, just like God said, defeated all the Amalekites. And then Saul thought, hmm, maybe I should just not kill the king. And, I, okay, I, I got another good idea. There's so much cattle here, I'll make a sacrifice to God. Yeah, that's what I'll do. So he's thinking, I'll lay all these sheep and goats and stuff on the altar and just bless God. Then God spoke to Samuel. He says, that I regret making Saul king. He has not obeyed me. How sad would that be if God told you, I regret making you? I regret creating you because you're walking in disobedience to my word. And so after this incident, God told Samuel to go speak to Saul. And Samuel went to rebuke him. Let's pick up the story where Samuel replied to him in Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your belief to his obedience to his voice? He says, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. See, we can easily take obeying God lightly, but we can see from this scripture that God takes obeying him very seriously. And why is obedience so important to God? I mean, why is God making such a big deal by him doing exactly what he said? I mean, if you think about it, he kind of accomplished most of the mission. I mean, he kind of wiped out the Amalekites. He just, there's just a couple little things that he didn't do. Samuel tells us in the very next verse, in verse 23, he says, rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. And stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. See, God speaks to us through his written word. And we choose obedient, disobedience to his word. God is saying it's so sinful, it's just like witchcraft. We all know how much God hates witchcraft. God hates idolatry. But he's saying when you choose to disobey me and not honor my word, it's just like that. Man. God, help us. God, help us to obey your word. 
God, forgive us when we just willfully chose not to obey you. This is what Saul was doing. Saul was leaning to his own understanding. And that's what we find ourselves doing. Be like, hmm, this sounds good to me. I think I'll do it. But God desires obedience. Our obedience matters to him more than anything that we could ever do for him. So ask the Lord, God, in what areas of my life am I not obeying you? God, in what areas of my life am I just dismissing your word and what your Holy Spirit has been saying to me? Because when we do, we get to walk back towards the light. We get to begin that process again of growing our intimacy with God. So we can do all the religious gymnastics to look the part, but when we're not obeying God's word, we're living in sin. But obedience to God's word is so good. Obedience to God's word is the soil that grows our intimacy with God. Only then can we say that we truly love God. Anything else is just noise. The standard in which we live should never be by another person, no matter how awesome they may be. See, our standard and example, again, is Jesus. And God's will for our lives is to be conformed into his likeness. God wants a whole bunch of Jesuses all around the earth. Looking like Jesus, loving like Jesus, he is our standard that we should strive to be like each and every day. 1 John 2.6, it says, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. John's telling us that. We should live our lives as Jesus did. See, Jesus lived on this earth to please his Father through complete and perfect obedience. He made himself of no reputation and lived as a humble servant. Jesus had perfect intimacy with his Father. And that should be our goal, to love like Jesus and to live like Jesus. See, when someone met Jesus, they were never the same. They always left him better than they were before they encountered him. What about you? When people meet you, when they leave you, are they in a better place? Are they feeling loved? Are they feeling encouraged? Did you bless them? Or do they feel worse or the same? See, if we're being conformed into the likeness of Jesus, we're changing. We're becoming more like him. And when we encounter people just because of who we are, we pour that out to them, and they leave us in a better place. And so that's kind of our homework there, is to make sure when people encounter us, they're encountering Jesus. Again, the Apostle John dubbed himself as the one that Jesus loved. He wanted them to get back to the basics of what intimacy is supposed to accomplish in us. See, the intimacy and closeness to God, what it accomplishes us is love. Love. That's a foreign word in this world. We see hatred, we see discontent, we see anger, we see all these deeds of the flesh, all these people walking in darkness. And the one thing that's coming out of the light is love. This is what the Apostle John was trying to get these Christians to see, that it's all about love. That it's all about love. We can look at 1 Corinthians 13 and we see that it's all about love. If love is missing, nothing else even matters. 1 John 2, 7 and 8. He says, dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. He says, rather it an old one that you have heard from the beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before. But he says, yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you are living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. See, intimacy with God leads to the desire and the ability to love others. I mean, God is a lot of things when we think about it, but ultimately, God is love. Everything that God does comes from his love, even his wrath. 
even his anger. Everything that he does, it comes from love. And we're all made in the image of God. So everything that we should do, everything that we say, everything that we think should all come from a posture of love. The ability and choice to love others, including those deemed unlovable, is proving something. It's proving something when we can love unlovable people. See, God has the ability to love the unlovable in us. Remember while we were yet sinners, Christ died? God is calling us to love others who may be deemed unlovable. Because when we do, it's proving something. It's proving that we know God and we have an intimacy with him. Because the Bible even tells us, if you love those who love you, what credit is that of you? Even sinners do that. But what about those who persecute you? What about those who hate you? You want to prove something? Love those people. But John also calls it an old, te- old commandment because it was an old commandment that was given to the children of Israel in the book of Leviticus. But it's also new because it is actually the governing commandment over the Christian life. That it's all about love. Jesus says loving God and loving your neighbor are the two great commandments. He's saying if we fulfill these two, we'll automatically fill all the other ones. Because if I love my neighbor, am I going to rob him? Am I going to murder him? Am I going to covet? No, because I love him. So when we hang on to those two, we feel all of the rest. See, love can be defined as selfless giving, reaching beyond, beyond friends to enemies and even persecutors. Love should be this unifying force. It should be the mark of every Christian, the mark of our lives. And so if you was to ask somebody, tell me the five characteristics that you see in my life, would they say love is one of them? Would they say, Bill, you're just one of the most loving people that I know. But that's what it should be. That's what it should be. So when people see you and you interact with you, do they see your love? Do they feel your love? Are you giving that off? Because we're supposed to look like and love like Jesus. And so when we're loving, it's showing that we're really in the light. It's showing that we have this growing intimacy with God. But if we're not loving, we're not walking in the light. And we don't have spiritual intimacy with God, especially if we're not loving others. Verse 9, it says, If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person still lives in darkness. I mean, this doesn't mean those, there won't be people who we don't like. I mean, you got some people who are hard to love, right? Amen? The Bible doesn't say you have to like everybody. It just says you have to love everybody. Because in life, listen, there's going to be drama. There's going to be miscommunication. There's going to be hurt feelings. There's going to be relationships that you're in that are going to end for whatever reason. But what has to happen is our love has to cover a multitude of sins. We have to keep loving even if the other person chooses not to. And guess what? I can even love you from a distance. You may say, I'm never talking to you again. And you say, Lord, bless them. Lord, would you bring healing to their heart? How awesome is it that we can step above the drama and still choose to be like Jesus and pray for those who are hurting us and said bad things about us? Our love must cover a multitude of sins even from the people who are the hardest to love. However, if we have hatred in our hearts, God wants us to know that we're not walking in the light, that we're walking in darkness. I mean, I've had times that people have hurt me. They've said things, they've done things, they've gossiped about me, and, you know, it it hurts. I mean, when someone who you care about or have a relationship with says things about you, especially if they're not true, it hurts. But I thank God he's given me the strength to always forgive, to always pray for them. And actually, there's been situations where I've even been able to love that person enough to have a new relationship with them. God is calling us to do that. He's calling us to be that bigger person. And whatever they did, we forgive. And we pray for them and we lift them up. See, our flesh would tell us, you know what? No, forget them. You gave them a second chance. 
That's like Saul, lean into your own understanding. One of the disciples asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? And he said seven times, thinking, I'm thinking it's really three, but I want to be a super Christian, so I'm going to say seven. And Jesus responded seven times 77. Basically, you don't stop forgiving. You don't stop forgiving because you're walking in the light. You have intimacy with God, so you're representing him. You're going, hey, you may hate me, but I'm still choosing to love you. I'm still choosing to pray for you and lift you up and encourage you. And it's, I hope that one day we can have a relationship again. That's what we do. We walk in love regardless of how hard it may be. And I was able to accomplish it in my life because I was walking in the light. See, if I was walking in darkness, again, I would have leaned to my own understanding in those areas instead of trusting God by walking in the light. 1 John 2, 10 through 11 says this, anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. We keep seeing this dynamic of light and darkness. That if we have hatred in our chart, Scripture gives us a tangible way to know in which area we're walking into. So we should know right away if our lives right now are living in the light or living in the darkness. Because, see, when we walk in darkness, we actually can't see. We're blinded by the darkness. And what we, what we miss is that we've moved far from God. Because as a reminder, God is light and there's no darkness in him. And so if we're walking in darkness, it means we're far from God because he is light. If we're walking from God, we can sense the light and we can sense God's presence and we can sense God's intimacy with us. Think about this world that we live in, how dark it is. And it's getting darker every day, right? We can't even look on the news and all we see is darkness everywhere we go. But the Bible tells us that's the way of the world. It's going to continue to get darker. This is why God is calling us to be the light. We're supposed to be this light, this tower of hope so people can find Jesus through us. But when we as Christians are choosing not to walk in the light, we look just like the world. And God is calling us to be world changers. But we can only do that if we're walking in the light. You see, although we're in the world, intimacy with God requires us not to be of the world. See, what happens is God is spirit, so we can't see him. Our entire lives were lived in this world. And what happens is we become of the world. That's part of that slow drift away from God. We begin to talk like the world, act like the world, and we're part of the world. But what God wants us to know is that we're not of this world. That we're here on assignment. That we are ambassadors of Christ. But what happens is those who are in the darkness, they love the world. And Christians find themselves loving the world too. But what they don't realize is, is that they're cheating on God when they do. Listen to James 4.4. He says, you adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? He says, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy to God. Whether we realize it or not, when we forsake our intimacy with the God through our fleshy gratification of idolatry, we forget that God is holy. We forget that God is not regular, but he is special. So holding hands with the world, in essence, leads us into darkness and out of fellowship with God. That's what it does. We forget that Christ is our husband. And what we start doing is we like living a double life. You know, we come to church and we say, praise the Lord. God, you're awesome. God, you're holy. You're righteous. And then we leave the light and go to the darkness. We're in the world on assignment, but we're not of the world. We're set apart, we're different, and we're holy. And God is saying, stay in the light, 
and walk in that. Just like the children of Israel, we have an incredible ability to forget God's love and kindness. God would always try to remind them, I led you out of Israel with a mighty hand. And what did they say when they were in the wilderness? Man, I want to go back to Egypt. I'm sick of this. We don't have no water. I mean, we don't have no food. And that's what happens to us when God comes through for us, when God answers that prayer, when God blesses us with that job. We're like, God, you're so awesome. Walk in the light. And this slow drift, then we find ourselves right back in the darkness, being of this world, walking in sin and idolatry. So the Apostle John wanted to give the Christians a reminder in verse 12. He says, I'm writing to you, to you who are God's children, because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. See, John wants to turn back time and I want you to think about this too, is when did you first gave your life to Jesus? Think for a moment back to that time when that first happened. Because remember, we forget. Like the children of Israel forgot that God brought them out with signs and wonders. Out of the hands of their oppressors for 400 years. We do the exact same thing. We have this spiritual experience where we commit our life to Christ and we, we go from death to life. God gives us this brand new spirit. And then over time, we start drifting back to the darkness. We start forgetting that it was Jesus who saved us from our sins. See, if the cross of Christ is not on the frontal lobe of your mind and your thoughts, we'll forget all that he's done for us. This is why we must deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow him. In church, God wants us to know that salvation is a free gift that is received by faith. We can't earn it. We can't work for it because it would cost more than what we could ever pay. However, intimacy with God is a choice that we must put the effort into making it happen. God has gone through great lengths to create an avenue for us to walk in the light and have intimacy with him. But we have to tangibly take those steps toward the light and choose as an act of our will to stay in the light. This is why each and every day we have to make a choice to choose Jesus every single day. Lord, I choose you today. Tomorrow, Lord, I choose you again. Because that doesn't happen by chance or by osmosis. It happens through a surrendered will. Because we are married to Christ. He is our husband. He expects us to be faithful and loyal to him. He expects us to spend quality time with him each and every day in his word and prayer and meditation and loving our brothers and sisters. Because when we do that, that keeps us in the light. That keeps us having a growing intimacy with God. See, in this life, we're going to have trials and tribulations. Bad things are going to happen to good people. We're going to go through the worst of the lows. We're going to lose loved ones. These things are going to happen. But the only way that we can endure those hardships in a way that's glorifying to God is if we walk in the light. Haven't you seen someone who went through the worst of the worst and you saw peace? You go, how can you have peace at a time like this? They would say, I'm walking in the light. I have this intimacy with God, so he's given me all that I need to help me what I'm going through. See, this is the type of person that doesn't just call on God when they're in a jam. Don't call on God when they just need him, but they walk with him. They keep in step with the spirit. They stay in the light. And so they can still have this internal fortitude and a peace that surpasses all understanding, even though the winds and waves and the trials of life are happening all around them. What about you when you go through hardships? Is your peace and happiness in life circumstantial? When you have good circumstances, you're good. But when you have bad circumstances, you're complaining. See, when you're walking in the light, you have a contentment in Christ. You have a joy that you can't explain. You have a cheerfulness and an excitement and an expectation of goodness in your life 
because you're walking with God. You're having this growing intimacy with him. And the only way that we can walk in the light is through this fellowship with God, this growing intimacy. Because, see, in the light, we can count it all joy because Jesus has overcome the world. And God calls us overcomers too. God is so kind to us to, to, to give us his word. He has this great desire for each of us to surrender each and every day and say, God, I choose to walk in your light. That God, as you extended your grace and mercy to me in my life, how can I not, God? See, the problem with sin and darkness is that sin always overpromises, but it underdelivers every single time. Every time you choose to do something contrary to God's word, you always say, man, why did I do that? Why? Satan is a deceiver. He's a liar. He wants to destroy your relationship with the Lord. And so he's going to tempt you. He's going to try to get you to do things contrary to God's word. But I'm going to ask you to trust the Lord. To heed his word and apply it to your life so that you can have a growing, thriving intimacy with him. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the Apostle John, God, and how you just written this epistle through his life, God. And Lord, we just want to say we're sorry that we repent in ways that we've missed it. In ways, God, we've leaned to our own understanding that we chosen as the act of our will to not give you complete obedience. And Father, we want to ask for a divine reset. That we're thankful, Lord, that your word says that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to cleanse us and of all unrighteousness, Lord. And Father, we just rebuke the darkness in Jesus' name. We rebuke the enemy from coming against your anointed. And that, Father, as an act of our will, we'll walk in the light. That from this day forward, that we would choose as an act of our will, Lord, to have a growing intimacy with you. God, we want to hear your voice. We don't want to just pray when we're in need. But we want to pray to you, God, just because we love you. And so, God, we thank you for your amazing grace, your steadfast mercies that are new each and every morning. And that, God, that you've given us the very, very best in your son. And we thank you, God, that he's our advocate. We thank you, God, that you've given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. So, Father, we just pray that you would honor this prayer that we're praying right now collectively. And that, God, you would meet us right where we are. And, God, that you would help us to stay in your marvelous, wonderful light. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. May everybody stand. We're so grateful for what God has begun here and what he's begun in each of us. And, you know, the, the messages that are spoken here at Powerhouse Church, they're not just random. They're all spirit-led. God is laying a foundation down for our church. He's laying a foundation down so that we can be grounded and rooted in his word. Because, again, trouble is going to come all around us. But when we're rooted and grounded in God's word, it won't sway us. We'll be able to stand firm in his word. And so a lot of our past messages are on our YouTube page at Powerhouse Church LV. And I just, if you haven't heard them, I say go back and listen to them. Because I just believe that there's principles in there from God's word that when we apply them to our lives, that it changes us. That we become better for King Jesus. And that's God's will for our lives. And that's what we want to do. Is we're a church that's all about love. Loving God, but also loving one another. And then we go out and we love this community around us. But I know that we, people come here today with burdens. Did you come here with brokenness? Did you come here with illnesses? That you have broken relationships, broken marriages? That we come here and we go through things. But by God's grace, he's a healer. That we believe that there's a God 
who can do exceedingly abundantly more than what we could ever ask or imagine. But God just tells us that we ask by faith. And so if you're here today and you have something that you need God to just deliver you from, to bring healing to, will you just raise your right arm and say, I believe that God can do it? And I'm just going to pray. And I just believe that God will continue what he started. See, there's many people who've come to Powerhouse and said that God has healed them, that God has healed their relationship, God has healed their body. And we believe that God is healing in this place today. And so will all of us just believe by faith right now that God will heal as I begin to pray for God's delivering power? Father, we thank you that you're our healer. We thank you, Jehovah Rapha, and that, God, you say without faith it's impossible to please you. So, Father, just like the woman who had the issue of blood and, and said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, God, we want to have that kind of faith today. To believe, God, that you could bring healing to our finances. God, we just rebuke the devourer in Jesus' name, God, from coming against our finances. And so, Father, I just decree and declare every person here, finances will be blessed. I I just rebuke the spirit of lack in Jesus' name. And, God, I just pray that you bring divine provisions to a person's life. And so, Father, I just pray as they honor your word, Lord, according to your finances, God, that you would open up the windows of heaven, God, and you pour them out a blessing. And, Father, I pray for every marriage that's here, God. I pray for divine healing and restoration, God. Father, I know that marriage is difficult. It is so tough, and the enemy wants to take the one flesh and make it into two. So, Father, I just rebuke him and bind him in Jesus' name. I ask for a hedge of protection, God, over every marriage that's here today, God, and watching online. I decree and declare wholeness, oneness, and unity in Jesus' name. And so, God, I just pray a spirit of joy, a spirit of communication, God, over this marriage. And, God, I pray for a newfound restoration of love and intimacy in Jesus' name. And, God, I just pray for any parent-child relationship, Lord. I pray, God, that you would bring divine healing, Lord. I pray for the prodigal son and daughter, God, who may be astray and may be lost. God, I ask that you would bring them back home in Jesus' name. And so, Father, I just pray that you would move in this place, Lord. And I pray that you would cover the people right now, Lord, with your blessings, Lord, for those who are in need. And so, Father, I just pray for whatever the need is that you, Lord, already know and that you would move. Father, you say when two or more gather together in your name, that whatever we pray for according to your will, that it shall be done. And so, Father, I just pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, for deliverance, Lord. I rebuke that infirmity in Jesus' name. Anyone has a medical issue right now, God, from the crown of their head to the bottom of their feet, Lord, I decree divine healing in Jesus' name. Lord, would you plead your blood right now over them, Lord? Would you make what's crooked straight in Jesus' name? And, Father, I praise you, God, that you're in all things. And, Lord, we thank you in advance for those who you're touching right now. And so, Father, be glorified as we choose as an act of our will today to walk in the light and to have a growing, thriving intimacy with you. We thank you now, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Thank you again for being here. If this is your first time, please say, let me say hi to you before you leave. You're all dismissed.